thinking about the case when Jesus came down from the mountainside. I believe it's Mark, early chapters of Mark, came down from the mountainside after a night of prayer to pick his disciples. And uh, he, he, the scripture says that he chose them to be with him and to, to do works of ministry. But the first thing Jesus wanted to do with them, he wanted to be with them. And he still wants to with us. And uh, just to live that out in a practical, everyday experience in the heartaches of life that uh, Jesus, who said he'd never leave me or forsake me, was actually true to his word. This is The Calling with Steve Smith, a Family Life original podcast that talks with pastors about the professional and personal challenges they face in their mission to lead others to Christ. Our guest for Episode 10 is Dominic Kriegbaum, pastor at A New Way Assembly of God Church in Watertown, New York. Talking with the Dominic, Reverend Dominic Kriegbaum. I'm just going to take a stab in the dark, and I'm going to tell you why I'm taking that stab in the dark. Uh, Reverend Dominic Kriegbaum of A New Way Assemblies of God Church in Watertown. Can I call you Dom? Is that okay if I call you Dom? You most certainly can. Yes, that that would work for me as well. Here's the reason. I knew you were kind of an informal, uh, just another, you know, great conversationalist, because uh, on the website, you're wearing a Buffalo Bills jersey, and that didn't seem to be too formal uh, at the time, which leads me to my next question. During falls and winters, uh, as you are speaking on Sundays, when when the Bills have a early home game, you know, the one o'clock kickoff, do you speak faster? on those Sundays? Oh, absolutely. Uh, our, our folks have been, our folks have been trained well enough to know that uh, we will be home by kickoff. In fact, it's it's become kind of a joke. I, I've been at this current location for over six years. And when we pe- plan our uh, annual Pastor Appreciation Day in October, uh, we don't plan the date until the football schedule is released. So I make sure it's either a late game or the bye week. <laughs> See, I knew you were my kind of guy. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it would only be appropriate for the pastor to be present for Pastor Appreciation Day. Exactly. Yeah, it's nice of you to show up for that one. Um, that, that's Absolutely. Good. Uh, Dom, tell us about A New Way uh, Church in Watertown, a little bit of the history of it, your history of it, and uh, tell us about your congregation. And uh, I know that's that's a, a hard question to put in a, in a short answer. So uh, take your time and tell us about uh, uh, A New Way Church. All right. Uh, well, I've been a senior pastor at a New Way Assembly of God in Watertown uh, for just over six years now. We've, My wife and I relocated to Watertown 27 years ago when uh, all of our kids were young and uh, too young to realize that we were pulling the oldest out of school and you'd have to make new friends. And uh, But we came to Watertown uh, to pastor a, another church where we remained there for 17 years, uh, also here in Watertown and um, raised our family here. And my wife uh, finished her master's degree while we lived here and became a kindergarten teacher in the Watertown City School District. This is her first year retired and she's loving it. Uh, But uh, we've been here now at a new way. Uh, Watertown is a military community uh, right outside of uh, Fort Drum. So a lot of military uh, in and out. Um, We enjoy them while we have them. They are, uh, for the most part, great workers, committed people, understand authority structure. And uh, so we enjoy them when we have them. And it's always tearful to say goodbye. Uh, my One of my daughters, in fact, married a military guy. And uh, so she is she is in the process of uh, exploring the world uh, for the next number of years with her hubby and her children. But uh, our congregation is your average size American church uh, on a good Sunday. If we count 75, 80, we consider ourselves a, a smashing success. And um, we, we, uh, we are large enough to pay the bills, but small enough for this pastor to know his people and uh, to cross them at a, at a supermarket someplace and know them by name. Uh, that's the kind of stuff I like. Uh, I, I, I don't want to sound uh, non-evangelical, but uh, I, I love the fact that I am a small church pastor. And that's something that I relish. Uh, 61 years old, been doing this for a long time. And um, just uh, I'm at that stage of life where, you know, we're talking football. Um, if if God blesses us with 80 years of life, uh, I have just entered the fourth quarter of the game and uh, starting to think of legacy and stories and and things that my grandchildren and great grandchildren that I haven't 
don't even have yet uh, stories that they could repeat and tell the same way I repeat stories from previous generations. So um, nice area, uh, beautiful area. Uh, winter is rough, but uh, most of your listeners are in that same situation. Uh, we get off of Lake Ontario, what uh, my hometown in Buffalo gets off of Lake Erie. Um, so uh, just uh, love and life, enjoying the ministry and uh, trying to influence people one at a time. Uh, we work on building relationships one step at a time is the tagline for our church. And we know that that doesn't just happen. That really has to be programmed and scheduled because uh, we can't build relationships by looking at somebody's bald head in front of us for an hour every Sunday. You uh, you led me right into my next question because I when you mentioned and described your congregation and how close you are, I would imagine home groups play a, a large role in that. Yes, they do. Home groups. Uh, we, we run one or two, uh, again, because of the size of the congregation and, and you know, the dynamics of home groups, uh, child care, uh, distance, um, weather in this case. Uh, but we do run uh, a gamut of uh, home groups, uh, small groups, uh, a men's group, a women's group, uh, you know, obviously uh, um, our, our children's ministries. Uh, is really a good heartbeat in our assembly. We're, we're uh, smack dab in Vacation Bible School week this week, which means, uh, you know, there, there's a couple things, and, and I'll fess up, a couple things that I as a pastor have learned to not appreciate through the years as far as giving me gray hairs, or in my case, no hairs. Uh, it's Vacation Bible School, Christmas programs, and church picnics. Uh, I would love to avoid all three of them, but my wife does all three of them superbly. So uh, I, I've married into the, the pastor's nightmare things. Let's talk about that uh, partner of yours, Tracy, uh, and how important uh, someone walking beside you in in this uh, walk and and tell us about the role that a pastor's wife plays. And I know you couldn't do without it. Did you- uh, ain't that the truth? Uh, married 37 years um, and just uh, just um, really uh, has been the person for me. Um, and, uh, we, we've walked through, uh, we walked through some pretty serious storms. Uh, ministry is, 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 uh, life consuming and it's, uh, it's a lot of joys. We live the best days of people's lives with them, but we also live the worst days of their lives with them. And, uh, even personally in our own lives and our experience, uh, I, I'm one of those guys that, uh, I've come to realize that there's more of us than I thought there were, but when it happened to me, I realized that there's a whole bunch of guys in, in my line of work that have experienced being terminated. And uh, we, we worked 17 years at our first church and uh, we're, we're, uh, uh, things went not too good. And uh, I entered the lines of the unemployed. And um, it was then that I realized that as a clergyman, you can't collect uh, unemployment in New York, uh, but you learn those things as you need to. Um, but a uh, very sad time for us going through that. Uh, worked our way back through. I, I ended up working. It was interesting. I worked for 14 months after I was terminated at a first church. Worked for 14 months at a nursing home in the area as a housekeeper. And uh, that was a very therapeutic time for me because, number one, it got me out of the church office into where real people were with some real needs. And I made some real connections in those 14 months, uh, but also gave me a renewed interest in the loss, a renewed heart for uh, for people who need Jesus. And um uh, I, I've done some weddings. I've done some funerals. Uh, I've baptized some people that I worked with, and uh, it, it was a it was a very very difficult dark season personally for my wife and I. Um, but uh, we we came through. Um, again, it, it wasn't a marriage issue. It wasn't an ethical thing. It was it was. Uh, well, we don't need to go into what it was because some of your listeners are familiar with it. Um, but um, it, it was a season of, of growth. And uh, without the right lady next to me, we found ourselves in, in a season where uh, for about a year and a half, uh, there's some some issues that we were dealing with as a family. And um, she would have her bad days and on her bad days, I'd be having a good day. And then I'd have my bad day and she'd be having a good day on that same time. And uh, having the right person to, to struggle through and and walk through the heartaches of life with is, is uh, absolutely a blessing from Jesus. You know, whether you're a pastor or anyone, uh, I think we can all look back on our hard times and say, you know, that's that's where we grew the most and we got stronger and we hated going through the tough times, but we uh, we got stronger. What else uh, you as a as you even talked about a human being? Yes, you were a pastor and let go. But what else did you learn about yourself during those hard times? I learned that the uh, that the Jesus I preach about, about being God with us, that Jesus wants to be with me. 
uh, is really true. Uh, Emmanuel, it's so easy to throw around these phrases and stuff when Christmas time. But uh, I'm thinking about the case when Jesus came down from the mountainside. I believe it's Mark, early chapters of Mark, came down from the mountainside after a night of prayer to pick his disciples. And uh, he, the scripture says that he chose them to be with him and to, to do works of ministry. And we love to talk about the disciples doing works of ministry, casting out demons and, and healing the sick. But the first thing Jesus wanted to do with them, he wanted to be with them. And he still wants to with us. And uh, just to live that out in a practical, everyday experience in the heartaches of life that uh, Jesus, who said he'd never leave me or forsake me, was actually true to his word. And and uh, there there were things that that were just came through through revelation that that I found out about myself. I found out about my call to ministry. I found out about uh, real people in real life situations. Um, it, it was uh, it was interesting working working with the elderly. Why why my wife was working with kindergartners was interesting to come home from work uh, at night and as I'd tell her that she chased five year olds around all day and I chased ninety five year olds around all day. Hmm. And but the the community that I worked with was amazing because I, I worked with history every day. I remember one time sitting with one of the residents. It was Pearl Harbor Day, and I, I know Pearl Harbor Day because my mom uh, was born on Pearl Harbor Day, but uh, it was her 16th birthday that it, that happened. And all through her life, she'd always tell me, you know, that was my 16th birthday. So here was a Pearl Harbor Day, and I'm sitting in an old folks home, and I sit with uh, I sit with Mr. Smith, and I say to him, tell me about what it was like on Pearl Harbor Day. You you know, you live there. That. I didn't. And kind of like what I'm going to do with my grandchildren when we talk about 9 11. You know? And I remember him gazing out his window and looking up into the sky and tears coming down his face and rolling down his cheeks as he recounted, uh, almost as if he were reliving it that very same day. And uh, that kind of stuff is absolutely precious. That kind of stuff uh, stays with you. And um, I, I will relish those, those months that I had working with the community and the elders, the elderly community. And um, again, just a bunch of coworkers that that knew I was a preacher and knew I was in between churches and knew I, I wasn't there for good and knew that wasn't my call to work at the nursing home and kept an eye on me. And uh, as a result of that, like I t- said earlier, just made a whole bunch of connections that are still reaping a harvest 10 years later. I think about the conversations that you and your wife, Tracy, would have after a a day at work, you at the nursing home, she at the kindergarten, and you'd talk about things. What did, uh, I would imagine also that during those conversations, you found some similarities from the kindergartners and the nursing home people. Uh, Did you have those conversations, like what those people from both ends of the spectrum had in common? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, we had, we had some of those, and of course, some of the comical ones that we could talk about is uh, um, uh, no teeth on both ends, and some <laughs> diapers on both ends, and yeah. potty problems. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, the fact of the matter of of um, uh, just um, people are people. You know, I think it was in the Muppet movie, one of the Muppet movies. Uh, one of the characters said to to Kermit, "Peeps are peeps." And, uh, you know, no matter no matter what the age group we're talking about, we're talking her with five year olds and me with 95 year olds. But uh, the entire gamut of mankind is is uh, is a mess. And I have no idea why God's interested in us other than the fact that he's proven himself not to be an absentee landlord. Uh, but he sticks around with us and he pursues us um, so much of what we think is us pursuing Jesus. But in reality, he's he's crazy about us. And. And I tell our folks that God gave his best for our worst. And if he were a general manager of the Buffalo Bills, he'd get fired immediately to trade the best player away for the worst player. <laughs> uh, he, he operates in a different dimension. And uh, uh, so, yeah, there are similarities of, of people. And, and the elderly, we dealt with their families. Uh, her with the kindergartner, she dealt with families. Uh, every family has different values, different dynamics. And uh, to, to try to balance those things is an act of God itself. Let's talk schools a little bit, a little older, uh, because a, a friend of yours, uh, I ran into him, uh, Ken Dudek, at uh, Kingdom Bound, the Christian Music Festival, ran into him, and he mentioned about uh, he's so passionate about Bible Clubs of America, and he said, oh, my friend Dominic Krigbaum is 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 involved with that as well. So uh, Ken was very passionate about it. Uh, can you tell me your involvement and, and what you can tell everybody who maybe doesn't know much about Bible Clubs of America? 
I sure can. I'll go back to uh, to way, way back in ancient history uh, in the uh, 1980s. Um, and uh, I was in youth ministry in Buffalo. We spent, uh, my wife and I spent 13 years in youth ministry between two churches in Buffalo. And uh, in, in uh, 1988, I believe it was, uh, we were at our one of our weekly youth meetings and, you know, the job of the ministry is to equip the saints. So we were, we were discussing with our youth group uh, what was ne- what is called the Equal Access Act, and Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, signed that into law in 1984. And the Equal Access Act basically says that a public school, if it allows a form for a non-curriculum related uh, club to exist, it has to open up for all non-related, non-curriculum related clubs. So, uh, a French club would be curriculum related because Fr- French is taught in school, but perhaps a ski club. Uh, would not be curriculum related. So if there's a ski club, uh, there could be a comic book club. And as a result of uh, the Equal Access Act, it opened up avenues for uh, Christian ministry to take place. Now, the Equal Access Act uh, provides for uh, before or after school, so non-instructional hours. There needs to be a faculty advisor and it needs to be student initiated. And uh, so all those things were were taught. We had the the Equal Access Act in print. Uh, We just encourage the students in youth group to consider where they may be able to fit because the heartbeat of God is evangelism. And, um, you know, like I say, we're in the midst of our vacation Bible school. Uh, If a five-year-old gives his heart to Jesus this week, uh, he's got an entire lifetime to to change the destiny of of hundreds, thousands of other people, Uh, not discounting the deathbed conversion of of a 99-year-old. Uh, but w- when we reach them young, uh, it's it's so much more exciting. Um, it's, and I, I say that as a father of three children, three adult children who all serve the Lord and, and seven grandchildren now. Um, so uh, we instructed about the Equal Access Act. And, and, and uh, one of the young ladies who was a new convert in our in our youth group uh, took it to heart. And she went to her school and talked to her principal about it, filled out the necessary paperwork to request a uh, Bible club. And in the course of a couple of weeks, I uh, received a note from the school that said that they were denied permission to meet. And this was at McKinley High School in Buffalo. Um, so uh, she came back and, and showed me the, the note. And uh, obviously, it was contrary to what federal law uh, stipulated. And I did something that that uh, is almost obsolete now as we're sitting here in, in 2023. I wrote a letter to the editor uh, I actually sat in an electric typewriter and typed out a letter and sent it to the Buffalo News. And um, I, I still have a copy of that. I was looking at it this morning, 171 words in my letter to the editor, basically just expressing that I was disappointed in the decision of the Board of Education uh, to deny uh, the access for a Bible club and, and cited the Equal Access Act and talked about uh, the denial of positive peer pressure that this could bring if if uh, there were such a positive group. And uh, so that that letter was published on, um, I believe it was February the 22nd in Buffalo News of 1988. Uh, two days later on the front page of the Buffalo News is a story about the Bible Club uh, being denied access. Uh, so as a result of a letter to the editor, the reporter was sent to the school. There's, there's a picture of the students, including Ken, uh, who were involved in, in the initial request. And uh, from that article, uh, within a week, I received a letter from a, a local uh, attorneys group, uh, Christian attorneys, that said that they would be willing to step up and represent the students pro bono. And uh, everything took off from there. And for a number of years, that Bible club worked its way up through the court system. And um, and as a result of all that stuff, back in the late 1980s, uh, Ken Dudek, who was one of those students as that was initiated, has recently launched this uh, Bible Clubs of America with a heartbeat to uh, carry on to the next generation what his generation was involved in, in legal battles and, and court issues and, uh, you know, the Buffalo Board of Education versus the students of McKinley. I mean, all this stuff is kind of scary, you know? You've been listening to Episode 10 of The Calling, a Family Life original podcast for pastors. If you like what you heard, be sure to share it with others and click subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. Be sure to check out all of Family Life's original podcasts, including Therese Talk, If That Makes Sense, The Powerable Podcast, and Business by the Book. You can find them wherever you download content or at familylife.org. 
Family Life is a not-for-profit listener-supported ministry, relying on your generous support to make podcasts like this possible. Find out how you can get involved when you go to familylife.org.